Um, so I, to go back, I started, I'm a PhD biologist. I started um, uh, in my job as executive director in 2000. Um, RMBL is a research platform, so we have scientists that come from all over the world, um, typically about 150 scientists um, each summer to research on a wide range of topics. And as I was thinking about the talk, and I put the talk together about a month ago, I realized there's probably a missing piece that I would have thrown in in retrospect, and that was to take a step back and talk a little bit about science. Um, and science, just to make kind of a, a sort of push the idea out there, um, that there is a reason the period before we started with science was called the Dark Ages. And that those were Dark Ages, both sort of literally as well as metaphorically. Um, most of what makes you happy as a person today is because of science. And so if you don't buy into the scientific process, you're not buying into the car you're driving, to the iPhone that you're using, to the GPS units that you're using to locate yourself. Um, all of innovation is being driven by science. And that's not to say that scientists are right. Uh, science is probably wrong more than they are right. But what it means is, is that there's a set of rules about how we go about making decisions and moving forward. And we use logic and we use the scientific process to kind of advance our understanding of the world. And so I kind of wanted to make just a general pitch for science and sort of and someone that brought this up to me about a week or two ago when we were talking, they're like, you know, if you don't buy into science, you're probably not buying into the reality of most of your life because all of the innovations that you take advantage of and drive the quality of your life are driven by science. Um, environmental science goes back to the beginning of science. Some of the very early scientists in the 1600s were environmental scientists. James Cook was out there, the establishment of the British Empire largely wrapped up with environmental science. Alexander Humboldt, who was out exploring South America, environmental science. Charles Darwin, environmental science. This year's Nobel Prize was awarded for work on circadian clocks. So whether you get tired at night, what happens if you fly across time zones? One of the critical early experiments done on the circadian clock was done in an outhouse up in Gothic in the 1950s. And so, so environmental science has been a part of the development of science ever since we started talking about science in the 15 and 1600s. Okay. So what I was going to do, 20 minutes is not a lot of time, um, is talk about an example. Um, there was a book I edited um, where we looked at it, a bunch of different case studies of the use of science. And this, this example, the Badlands down in Arizona and New Mexico involved management decisions. So I thought it was kind of a nice example of ranchers, scientists, and federal land managers working together. Um, the first point I wanted to make is that good decision making um, based upon science matters. And one of the examples I'm gonna give you is up in the Northeast um, the fisheries, the cod fisheries collapsed. And when the cod fisheries collapsed, they lost 30,000 jobs. They lost 12% of the jobs in the Northeast. And that was because they were making bad decisions about how to manage fisheries and which that cat, what that catch should be. Um, one third of New York's forest is harmed by too much grazing. Making good decisions about hunting and culling of wildlife has big impacts in the health of those forests. And we can argue that any which way. There was a, an economic report that came out in the late 1990s that was recently updated. Um, the value of ecosystem services, ecosystem services are things like water, air, uh, hunting, recreation. It's on the order of trillions of dollars a year. It's equivalent to what we would consider sort of standard economic activity. So good decision making around ecosystems matter, and that's what they're talking about in this series of land management and making good decisions. Um, decision making around natural systems is hard. So that probably means that often we're gonna be making bad decisions. We could be making worse decisions, so just because you make a bad decision doesn't mean you're necessarily doing the wrong thing because there can be many uh, types of bad decisions. Um, and when I say, decision making around natural systems is hard. What I mean is biological systems have different levels of organization. So if you look at my little chart on the top, it goes from a, a gene to a protein, to a cell, to an organism, to an ecosystem. Often we have to understand those full range levels of organizations in order to make decisions. 
And to make life even more challenging, every ecosystem is different. Your backyard is different than your neighbor's backyard. And those ecosystems, even in the same location, are really different from year to year. So this is a picture in the bottom right of the Gothic Valley, almost the same day, um, three years apart. One year, completely covered in snow. That will not be this year, right? This year, we're not, you know, unless we get really lucky, we're not gonna have snow on the ground <coughs> up in Gothic uh, in mid-June. Same day, a couple years later, we're full flush in vegetation. And so these ecosystems that we're having to manage, it's really important how we manage them, but it's not easy because they're really complex and each one of them is different. Okay. We have an approach in science to managing complexity. In complexity, complex systems are things that involve lots of different interacting parts. Your body is a complex system. If you've ever gotten into a cycle, you get older, you start breaking your wrist, you start running into problems, you're not exercising, things will fall apart. End of life, what's happening is your system starts shutting down in really complex ways. The human brain is a complex system. A fruit fly is a, is a complicated system. We've learned that the way we study complex systems is to use case studies. The business world can't study every business, and a business is a complex system, they use a case study approach. They will look at an example and learn from that example and push that into new context. And so that's how scientists think about managing complex systems is often they'll use case studies. What did we do with ranching in Wyoming? Can we apply those lessons learned down in Southern Colorado? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There's an art to figuring out how to jump from ecosystem to ecosystem. So we are working with Mary Price this book we put together talks about how you work with scarce data. So when you don't have a lot of data, but you still have to make decisions. You're working with complex and idiosyncratic systems. Your yard is different than your neighbor's yard. Your yard changes from year to year. And then higher changing dimensionality. And by that I mean you have like 100 different variables. And they could be changing from year to year. Um, so one way of thinking of this is scientists typically talk about general theory. So it might be evolution as a theory, um, physiology, how circadian clocks work. Um, we have management decisions that we have to make. Typically in biology, because we're working with complex systems, we have this intervening box, which is we apply theory to a specific system. And what we learn from that one system will help us make management decisions that we have to make across the country or across the world. So it's an approach we call the ecology of place which is you use information about single locations to inform how you think about ecosystems all around the world. So jump to the example. I'm gonna start running out of time here soon. So the Malpai borderlands, Malpai means badlands. Um, the large area down in New Mexico and Arizona on the Mexican border, 40% uh, of the land down there are public land, so it's very similar to what we have here in Gunnison County. They've got Forest Service, they've got Fish and Wildlife, BLM, they've got the states of Arizona and New Mexico. Um, they've had issues with invading shrubs. So if you look at photographs going back 100 years and before and after, and it's hard to see it from these photos, they've got shrubs in places that they never had shrubs. And that undermines their ability to forage. It's reducing their foraging, having big impacts on grazing. Um, they, land managers were making decisions about how to manage fire out there that were having big impacts. And everybody who had been working in those ecosystems had very different opinions about what was going on in terms of managing fire and grazing. Um, and they needed to know, how does that landscape work? How do they can reduce the uncertainty? How can those different groups work together to achieve the desired states? And so the desired states would include such things as how do you um, maximize productivity so you can have economically viable grazing operations. How do you reduce your threat from fire? So you've got to spend a lot of money on suppressing fire. You've got to spend money because you've got people developing houses and places and so firefighters are having to respond. Um, so they pulled together um, a group to look at that. And one of the things I emphasize is that science <coughs> is really about having a conversation. And scientists, when they're doing an experiment, I say all they're doing is they're figuring out a way to have a conversation with the landscape. So an experiment is nothing more than a way of asking a question um, 
obviously the earth or the ecosystem doesn't talk. So, you know, we can't just say, hey, you know, what's going on? Should we stop burning you? So what we do is we use experiments and studies as a way of asking questions of that landscape. Um, what they did in this system was they built a model of how that ecosystem worked. So they brought the land managers together with the scientists, with the ranchers, and they spent a lot of time exploring that wisdom. And those different stakeholder groups all had really useful information about how those landscapes worked. The reality was is none of them really knew, but all of them had good ideas. And so what they did was they combined those multiple perspectives and they identified where the uncertainty and the disagreement was and they figured out ways to pose questions and set up large scale experiments. And so um, it turned out that the way that um, by suppressing fire, it could be that suppressing fire was what was allowing those shrubs to come in. And so that was reducing the availability of forage to the ranchers and undermining their ranching operation. So they could kind of figure out where those points of disagreement were and they could set up experiments and studies to address that. And by working together, the ranchers could implement experiments on larger scales than the scientists could ever apply, right? So the ranchers are out there raising thousands of heads of cattle, uh, huge areas on the landscape. And so by working together, they could figure out ways to reduce their uncertainty. And, and they had to be honest, right? Because the idea is that an experiment tells you when an experiment tells you, and people are gonna have to accept what that answer was. And that goes back to my original point, is nobody really knows the answer, but we, what we do agree to are the ground rules. So that there is logic, there is natural history, there is physiology, and the way we interpret those, we all have to agree that those are acceptable. Um, I like to throw out uh, Bayes' <coughs> theorem. So sometimes people think that science is some, something to do with people wearing white lab coats and test tubes. And the reality is, is that science is more like the game Clue. So the game Clue is like, who committed what crime and where did they do it, right? It was the butler with the candlestick and the pantry. And in order to get to that answer, they're not conducting experiments. They might try to trap the butler, right? Like you ask a question and confuse them and that's sort of an experiment. The reality is, is you're using every piece of information that you can to get to the best decision. A good scientist is like a gambler that's making money off of NBA basketball, right? They can't run an experiment. They can make money and they can be really good at it. And they do that by using every piece of information that's available. And there is a statistical framework, Bayes' theorem, that you can use to integrate lots every type of piece of information. And so one of the misperceptions of science is that science can only use a certain type of information. It's gotta be validated by a priest in a white coat and says that's science and that's the information we're gonna use. The reality is, is that you can use lots of pieces of information. And Bayes' theorem is a way that we pull that together. And, and one of my favorite examples is that we lost uh, an H-bomb in World <coughs> War II and we had no clue where it went. And they applied Bayes' theorem and they found it. And they did that by pulling in lots of different pieces of information, talking to experts and integrating that information. And it's kind of like magic. They came up with that. They took these statistical techniques and they classified them as top secret. And so if you look in biology and statistics, a lot of the methods from Bayes was actually classified and not pushed out into the scientific world the last 20 years or so people are starting to use that information in some of those approaches. Um, so it turns out that what they've been discovering up in the Badlands is that fire is a necessary feature of native grasslands. Um, so it's really mediating um, what's going on in these large scale experiments which emerged from these different stakeholder groups getting together and not necessarily agreeing, but agreeing to disagree and agreeing to identify where the uncertainty was and how you reduce that uncertainty they were able to get to answers um, that have been very powerful. So Gunnison Basin, how much time do I have? I was supposed to be getting cues, but am I doing okay on time? You have 15 minutes left. Really, I've only been talking for five minutes? <laughs> no, you have, uh, you have 30 minutes. Oh, I have 30 minutes. Yeah. I get to talk for a lot, okay. Um, so for Gunnison Basin, um, I think a lot about, so how do we apply that example from the, from the Malpai borderlands to the Gunnison Basin. 
And what I would suggest is, can we identify core values? Can we agree on sort of the terms of the game? And um, we're not gonna agree on the outcome or the decisions, but can we agree on the rules? And so when I thought about, well, what are the rules? And this is sort of based in science. I thought of rules, are we gonna use the best information, right? So are we gonna agree as a community that if there's information out there and some information is better than others, are we gonna to agree to using that? Um, are we in it for the long term? Right, and so RMBL has been out there for 91 years. I've been in this community for about 31. My kids were born here. People who are committed to the community and are here for the long term are committed in ways that people who are here for a short period of time aren't, right? And so, because if you're committed to the long term, um, you're gonna see the people that you disagree with in the grocery store, right? That is a different dynamic than kind of like just coming in from DC and making a decision and taking off and going home. Right, and so I think one of the core values that we can really grasp, hold on to in the Gunnison Basin is not only are we gonna use the best information, but we're gonna to commit to being in it for the long term. And the reality is, is a lot of these questions that we're dealing with are not gonna be resolved in the short term, right? And so if we're trying to figure out what's going on with herds, depending upon how long those bucks live and how long it takes to go through the life cycle, if we're gonna reduce uncertainty on that, that's not gonna happen next year. It's not gonna happen in five years, right? If we come in with a well-implemented plan to kind of understand dynamics, we're committing to experiments and studies that are 10 or 20 years long. And we have to commit to kind of each other to persist through that uncertainty and disagreement to get to the answers. And so one of the things I think about for the Gunnison Basin is let's commit to using the best information and commit to being in it for the long term. Um, and then I also think one of the things, and I think this is a legacy that goes back to the ranching community, uh, you know, my interactions are that the ranching community is one of the best legacies that we have here. The ranchers that I interact with are very pragmatic, they're very outcome oriented, they will use the best information. Sort of a joke up in Alaska that there are no stupid bush pilots, right? I would say economically, the same thing is true here. Ranchers that are not super sharp are not ranchers in the Gunnison Basin anymore. And so those ranchers that we have here are incredibly bright, they're very pragmatic, they've been dealing with this landscape for a long time. Um, so, you know, I think we, that's a legacy that they give to us. Um, and I think an important part of the Gunnison Basin is that we value all the perspectives. It doesn't mean that everybody's right, it doesn't mean that everybody gets to have an equal say, but what it does mean is that we listen to everybody and we incorporate into that and we apply those same set of rules to what everybody brings to the table. Um, and so uh, I think we've been very successful with Sagegrass. Get that a second. Collaboration. Um, I think collaboration is a muscle. And I think some communities have developed that. So a muscle is something that you exercise and when you exercise it, it gets stronger. And that's one of the things that I think we've inherited from the ranching community is that they have been collaborative. So muscles that you don't exercise don't get used. And what, what I mean by collaboration being a muscle is people have to know who to talk to. They have to share their perspective. They have to respect that perspective. They have to be willing to listen. They have to be able to push through disagreement. And communities that have figured out how to do that have a baseline of trust that sets them up to get through that next level of conflict. And so when I think about you know, what are the core values in Gunnison Basin that we have and that I would like us to see maybe have more of. Let's commit to using the best information. Let's commit to being in it for the long term because the reality is, is most of these questions are not short term questions. Let's value everybody's perspective. That doesn't mean everybody's right, but it means that we're gonna apply the same set of rules to all those perspectives. And we're gonna exercise our muscle of collaboration. And so each time we go through a different cycle, whether it's water use, like this community has been incredibly effective at protecting our water and thinking about water, right? So that sets us up for the next round of success. I have no doubt that our ability, and I know that a lot of people are frustrated about sage grouse and would have liked to have seen a different answer. The reality is, is I think this community has been very effective around sage grouse. The limitations probably have more to do with limitations on the federal government and how they manage it than based upon limitations on our community to respond. So I would say our ability, you know, Butch Clark and other people who've been involved in water um, 
since the late 80s and early 90s, that was a muscle that we learned to exercise that served us well when we had to deal with sage grouse. Um, and then wildlife management. You know, I don't, I'm not that involved in wildlife management, so I really have no sense of where we're at on that. Um, but I think we have a lot of opportunities in, in Gunnison to do something truly unique. Okay, how much time do I have? You have about 10 minutes, uh, nine minutes. Nine minutes, you're, you're eight through. minutes and 55 seconds, yeah. 54 so, seconds. So if you're through early. I'm gonna, I'll say a few other things okay. and then I'll close up if that's okay. Sure. Okay, um, so I'll sort of step back and just give a little bit of a summary of the talk and then I think we'll answer questions at the end and the other speakers can use up my time. Um, but, but I would encourage you to think a little bit about science. Um, an economist would say, where is economic growth going to come from? And often growth is a loaded term. So I encourage you to think of growth not just as more people or more buildings, but growth is the ability to do more things with fewer resources. So growth is the fact, I was talking to uh, uh, someone today, 1970s, he started his accounting career in the early 1970s. If he wanted to run a financial model, they did it by hand, right? So like you change this parameter and then you spend seven days or plug in the numbers. Excel files, we can do that in 10 minutes, right? That's an example of growth. Most of what we um, drives the quality of our lives are the ability to translate science into things that make our life better. You know, light is probably one of the biggest innovations. So think a little bit about not just the fact that um, science is something that's out there, but science is something that's structured our whole lives and you are committed to a life of science, whether you're happy about it or not, and whether you agree with it or not, you live a life that's embedded in science, and the rules of the game have gotten us there. Um, environmental science is really complicated for the reasons I've talked about. We could spend more time talking about that. Um, how do you make decisions when things are changing rapidly? There are people that are really good at doing that. Often they make lots of money on the stock market, um, one of, when I was a graduate student, took a class in uh, sort of environmental decision making or ecology. After I took the class, it's a, a biologist, and I checked him out, he's working for Deutsche Bank. Because it turns out that making money off of the stock market is not that different than managing ecological systems, because they're both very complex and changing very rapidly. But there are tools because people do make money off of the economic systems. And just like people can make money off of the economic systems, we can apply those techniques to making solid environmental decision making. Um, what I liked about the Maupai Borderlands example is simply how they brought these very different communities together. And this is an approach that's been applied in other contexts. Up in Alaska, they're working with Native Indian communities to try to apply basic uh, knowledge from their community and push that into environmental decision making. There are lots of different ways that people have knowledge that can be used in order to inform decision making. There is a rigorous framework. You probably use it all the time. You are a, a sort of a Bayesian machine. So we learn more about how the brain works. The way your brain works is it's applying a lot of these statistical tools. Artificial intelligence is trying to figure out how your brain works because someone's going to make a lot of money once they do it. There are ways to bring in lots of different types of information in order to improve decision making going forward. And the Maupai Borderland, I think, is a great example of those different communities using experiments, using observations, using historic knowledge to make decisions around grazing and fire to do that. So with that, I'm going to turn over the rest of my time to the speakers that follow. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Melanie Armstrong from Western School of Environment and Sustainability. So I'll provide a second presentation or uh, foundational perspective and not take extra time to do so, hopefully, um, by providing a bit of a historical context for understanding wildlife management. And you have to pick some place to start in this conversation, so I'm going to choose to start in 1803 with the expedition of Lewis and Clark into the Western United States. And this is a quote that actually comes from the journals of Meriwether Lewis on their return trip. So the, the quote comes from 1806 uh, of a scene they encountered near uh, Great Falls, Montana. 
And for those of you who can see the slide, the, the misspellings are direct from the journals, but I will read it to hopefully make it more intelligible. This is not me and my typos. So we proceeded with the party through a level, beautiful, and extensive high plain covered with immense herds of buffalo. The bulls kept a tremendous roaring. We could hear them for many, many miles, and there are such numbers of them that there is one continual roar. The Missouri bottoms on both sides of the river were crowded with buffalo. I sincerely believe that there were not less than 10,000 buffalo within a circle of two miles around that place. 10,000 buffalo within a circle of two miles. Our accounts of the West are full of these, these statements about the bison herds across the Great Plains. Lewis and Clark knew they would encounter bison, but I doubt that since bison had no longer were living on the east side of the Mississippi at the time they began their expedition, they could not have anticipated crossing through herds of bison of this size. Settlers traveling on the Oregon and the, and the uh, Santa Fe Trail report crossing through herds for multiple days with thousands and thousands of bison. It was during this time, though, in the 19th century that our perspectives on wildlife began to change. In fact, at this time, we started to think about extinction as a reality. In the 19th century, we uncovered the first bones of animals in the United States that did not currently live in the, in the, in the area. Think about that. The idea that there were animals that once existed on the earth that no longer exist today was a revolutionary thing during that time period. And so as extinction becomes a re reality, not only are we being exposed to animals that once existed that no longer existed, but this was also the era when we began to see the possibility of species that we knew currently it going extinct. So when I say extinction became a reality in the 19th century, this was something that people were living within their lifetime. Flocks of passenger pigeons that once darkened the entire sky were gone. By 1912, the passenger pigeon was extinct. And we saw this happening during a time of growth in our country, during a time when people were starting to think about landscapes differently. And often when we think about this history, we turn to landscapes first. We think of people like John Muir, who advocated for the conservation of wild places, of lands that served a role for humans outside of, of use, of gaining something from the landscape. And so we saw the creation of national parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone, and the creation of national forests and other land conservation. But I want to argue that it was more than just the setting aside of these places that began to shape how we understood wildlife and our relationship with them. And I want to present a case from Yellowstone, uh, which was uh, created as a national park in 1872. And I want to connect that to the demise of the bison, these great herds of bison that we had seen across the plain, that by 1903, there would be just about two dozen wild bison remaining in the country, a wild herd that was left inside the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park. And I want to tell you a story. And this story takes place in Yellowstone, in the Pelican Valley, uh, among one of these dwindling herds of bison. During this time, poaching was pretty common inside the boundaries of Yellowstone. We had these wild bison. There were probably about 400 around in 1894, which is the time when this story takes place. The Army was managing Yellowstone. We didn't have a National Park Service at that time. So the Army was, was in charge of the park. They were doing their best to kind of keep tabs on what was happening among wildlife in the park. And they knew that people were coming in and they were poaching. And one morning, Captain Anderson woke up to see herds of, or tracks left behind from the sled of a poacher who they'd been trying to get tabs on. And so they sent, he sent one, a civilian scout along with a captain down to follow those tracks into the park and see if he, they could figure out what was happening where this poacher was. So Felix Burgess and Captain Troika set off in pursuit of Edgar Howell, one of the most notorious Yellowstone poachers. They traveled deep into Yellowstone. They actually spent a night at the newly built Yell uh, Lake Hotel and then headed out in a snowstorm north into the Pelican Valley. 
following those tracks that they had been tracing all this time. As they follow those tracks, they passed a, a tree in which were hung six bison skull, bison head at the time. And they knew that they were approaching upon Edgar Howe. They came across, across a place that he had clearly been camped, trodden down by footprints, and they're getting deeper and deeper into the Pelican Valley when all of a sudden they hear shots ring out. One shot, another shot, three, four, five shots ring out through that quiet Yellowstone snow. They come up into a clearing in the valley and they see Edgar Howe hunched over the bison that he has just shot and killed, beginning the process of beheading them. Imagine for a moment that you are Felix Burgess, a civilian scout standing a couple hundred yards away from this notorious poacher who has just shot and killed some of the last remaining wild bison in North America. What are you going to do? Burgess was carrying a revolver. Edgar Howell was carrying a repeating rifle that could kill a bison through a one inch thick uh, hide. There's about 200 yards of open snow between the, the scouts and the poacher. Edgar Howell had a dog that was with him. His back was turned, the winds were favorable, and in a moment, that young scout made the decision to risk crossing that snowy field and try to apprehend Edgar Howe. I imagine him taking a deep breath, kind of surveying the landscape around him, and sending out on his skis across that field, hoping that the dog would not turn around, that the poacher would not sit up. As luck would have it, he made it within 15 feet before Edgar Howe saw him, stood up, and turned around but he was already being held at gunpoint and being arrested for what he was doing inside Yellowstone Park. Felix Burgess escorted Edgar Howe back up towards Fort Yellowstone and word of his travels or of what he had done preceded him and the military was, uh, captain was being <coughs> visited by two reporters who had been sent from the Forest and Stream magazine founded by George Bird Grinnell which would later become Field and Stream Magazine. And he suggested that they might head out and meet up with this party coming back with Edgar Howe. So these two reporters come down and they are accompanied by a photographer, uh, F.J. Haynes, who did a lot of work in the area. And they met up along the road. And they took this photograph of that, of that arrest of Edgar Howe. And then they told the story. They told about the arrest of Howe and what was happening in Yellowstone and they wired it back by telegraph. And in that story, they told of Howell's boasting to them that the army could do nothing to apprehend him except confiscate $30 worth of property and evict him from the park. And so in the laughing and the echoing of that poacher's laughter, those reporters took pen to paper and told that story in order to enact change. Within 12 days, Representative Lacey had introduced a bill to Congress to outlaw poaching in Yellowstone Park. That legislation sailed through the House and the Senate, and by the time Edgar Howe was released from Yellowstone, it was well on its way to being signed into law. The Lacey Act was passed, the flying colors became law, and in an ironic twist, it was Edgar Howe who returned to Yellowstone, um, perhaps in some ego moment where he was trying to, to boast of what he could do, was having his hair cut in the hotel in Yellowstone, the park that he had been evicted from. When the army heard word that he was there, they sent soldiers out to arrest Edgar Howe for coming back into the park, and he became the first person to be prosecuted under the law that his actions had led to the establishment of. So a couple takeaway messages from this story. I think the important one for me is recognizing that this was a moment where the US government decided that it was going to play a role in the protection of species. That this was going to be the work of government to preserve species and wildlife within the United States. We saw the Lacey Act as maybe one of those first moments. And I'm gonna to talk tonight of several of the core values around which we have centered wildlife conservation in the country. And I would put that forward as the first one, this core value that this is the responsibility of government. 
that we shouldn't take that for granted, right? Perhaps we could, the, the idea that we believe that government should be involved in managing wildlife is not a given, right? We could have different ideas about that. Of course, it wasn't just government that was involved in this early conservation work, and many others played a role. I'll briefly touch on another uh, famous story that has to do with, with bird plumage, which was very popular around the turn of the century for the creation of uh, feathered hats for women to wear. And we saw the demise of, of bird populations as fashion changed around, around the uh, turn of the century. Uh, in 1886, it was estimated that more than 5 million birds were massacred that year in order to provide plumage for women's hats in the state of New York alone. So as we thought, uh, you know, as this became known and people began to recognize it, it was actually two women, uh, Harriet Hemingway and Minna Hall, who began a petition to get women to sign on to vow that they would not purchase goods that were made from feathers that had been uh, poached among wildlife. And they said, we sent circulars asking women to join a society for the protection of birds. And 900 women joined this upper class boycott of fashion. That same year, they established the Massachusetts Audubon Society. And within the next several years, more than a dozen local chapters were created. And in 1905, those chapters joined together to become the Audubon Society, a federation of local chapters. And their work eventually led to the creation or the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in order to protect what had been happening with the, plumbing, the, the poaching of wildlife for women's fashion. And this becomes a model that we see throughout conservation history of people advocating for change, legislative responses, again affirming the role of government in the protection of wildlife. So as a real brief overview, as we move into the next era, we saw the Duck Stamp Act in the 1930s along with two other pieces of legislation, the Pitt Pittman-Robertson Act and then later the Dingell Johnson Act. And a key thing that I want to point out about, out about these is that each one of these acts directed money towards the work to conserve wildlife. So not only do we need to give the government authority to conserve wildlife, but we've got to provide some means for them to do that conservation work. So the duck stamp provided funds for bird sanctuaries and breeding grounds. Um, Pittman-Robertson was a tax on firearms to fund wildlife restoration um, and has generated over $10 billion for the uh, conservation of wildlife, which has largely been used to purchase more than 4 million acres of land to protect wildlife. And the Dingle Johnson Act provides funds to the states, another key idea that you'll hear in this series over and over again, to provide funds to the states to manage aquatic resources. And of course, there were numerous individuals and agencies involved throughout this process. Um, all doing their separate conservation and advocacy work as the current management system that we see today took shape. As we move out of the 1950s and into the 1960s, we see another transition, a new way of thinking coming into our core value system. In 1963, the Leopold Report was published, uh, created by the son of Aldo Leopold, um, a famous name in env the environmental movement. And the Leopold Report was directed primarily to national parks, but the idea behind it was that parks could manage, par that we could manage park visitors and ecosystems under unified principles. So the idea that the land would, this was the kind of thinking that we would bring landscape management to think both about people and wildlife together. This might also be one of the key moments for thinking about nature of ha as having its own intrinsic value, as something that people could conserve nature, not just for the use of people, but because it had some value outside of humans. And this is the type of thinking that led to movements like the work to restore uh, predator species. So the restoration of wolves in Yellowstone might be seen as a long-term outcome of the Leopold Report through the idea that this is not about just protecting game species, but about preserving key species that maintain ecosystem health from the top to the bottom of an ecosystem. So what do all of these acts mean in terms of our larger thinking about the environment? 
it's, it might be easy to think about a progression from more conservation values towards preservation values, and I want to challenge that. I want to challenge us to not think about conservation and preservation as opposites, but maybe to think about them as two sides of the same coin. That both conservation and preservation are rooted in that key idea that it is the responsibility of government to manage landscape, to manage wildlife for people. And that's a, that's a value that we could argue with. So another core value at play here is the stake that we have in public and private lands. And if you look back in the history of our nation, you'll see these values of private property and private ownership rising to the surface over and over again, right? This, our nation was founded upon the idea of private property. And in just a moment, Brandon is gonna talk about the public trust doctrine as it relates to the public ownership of wildlife. And I want to challenge you to think about how unusual that is in our nation that is so rooted in private ownership of things, that we cling to that value of private property. And we have other models that do this differently. If you look in England, uh, for example, you'll see that a model that's grounded in the right that individuals have to harvest game off of their own land and sell it for, for public consumption. This is not legal in, in our model here in, in North America, but is done in other places. Other models, such as we see in South Africa, where a nation has really focused upon incentivizing private landowners to conserve wildlife rather than kill wildlife for be their benefit. And so here we see you know, wild species, or the government putting its effort towards land management on its own public lands and then turning private organizations, giving them authority to manage the wildlife that cross into their landscape. And, and this brings incentives, right? It's an incentive-based management program because the whole management system in the southern countries of Africa rests upon the idea that wildlife is more valuable alive than it is dead. And so they put a lot of money and effort into creating a tourism trade around wildlife management that gives value to wildlife that is particularly alive, but heavily relies upon private organizations that advocate for that conservation, a market-based approach very different than the model that you're going to hear about from Brandon that we use in North America today. Just two quick parting thoughts related to this. Another core value that we have is around crisis management. And maybe this doesn't seem like a value, but much of our wildlife management in this nation is very reactionary. We think about endangered species and how we manage species that are on the brink of extinction. We are continually thinking about how we are going to bring them back rather than what we are going to do today to keep species from going extinct three or four generations from now. And so that reactionary approach you'll see coming into all of the conversations that we're having about wildlife. And I challenge you to think about what we can do to be less reactionary, to shed that value of crisis management and find a new way forward. And in closing, a core value centers around wildness. When you think about what you want in your wildlife experience, how many people are thinking about something like this? The opportunity to see wildlife in its own native habitat doing those things that wild animals do. This core value shapes how we manage wildlife in this country. We don't manage it like a farm. We don't manage it like a zoo. We don't try to, to create as many game species as we can on the landscape in order to, to provide us particular experience. Instead, we want our hunters to be able to have that glimpse of a wild animal on their experience of the hunt. We want travelers in Yellowstone to see those elk out in the landscape being wild animals. But I challenge you in thinking about wildness as a value in our wildlife management to recognize how that value falls short. This is an image taken, a photo taken on the National Elk Refuge just south of Yellowstone Park. When children are traveling through Yellowstone and their heads are pressed up against the window, ooing and eyeing about seeing wild elk in Yellowstone, those elk in the wintertime wander south until they hit the urban areas of Jackson, Wyoming, can't wander any further and stop at the elk refuge where they are fed hay by sleigh all winter long. Is that a wild animal? 
Those are the kinds of values that come into play when we continue to debate how we're managing wildlife in our landscape conservation today. So I challenge you to, to refer back to and think about these as you hear these other perspectives from the land managers uh, tonight and throughout the rest of the series to recognize how values both impact the wildlife management practices that you'll hear about, but also the approaches that have guided our management philosophy over time. Thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce Brandon Diamond from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Thanks, everybody. Um, I really appreciate, thank you, Carissa. I really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Hopefully this is a fun evening for you and we hope to see you next week. Before I start, um, I really wanted to just personally thank Western State Colorado University, the faculty, the students, they've really gone above and beyond to put this together for you guys um, and it's much appreciated. I also want to personally thank all of the sponsors that contributed to the, the, the program. You folks were way more than generous on it, and we really couldn't have done it without you. So thank you very much for that. Woo! And tonight, I, I'm going to talk about um, a topic that's really near and dear to me, both personally and professionally, and, and is more so every year. So by a show of hands, um, how many of you guys have heard of the North American model of wildlife conservation? Okay, so that's a lot. Um, and that's what I would expect in our community. Of those folks that raised your hands, how many of you feel like you understand the functional components of the model and how it works? Now that's, that's great. Uh, so hopefully everybody leaves here with something tonight, a refresher for some of you and some new information. Um, when, when I was a kid, uh, my childhood experience was probably a lot like many of yours, in that I grew up fishing a lot, always in the woods. I watched my dad hunt, I watched my dad's friends hunt, I watched my brother hunt, and at the time to hunt big game, you have to be 14, and when I turned 14, it was as if it was uh, uh, my birthright to wake up and I was an elk hunter, all right? And I was gonna go elk hunting when I was 14. There was no question about it, there was no other path in life, that's just how it was. Um, and I had no idea at that time all the forces that had culminated in my ability to, to believe that. Um, it's a very special thing that we enjoy um, and not something to be taken lightly. So as the name implies, the North American model evolved in North America, particularly in the United States and Canada. And I would argue that the United States really paved the way in terms of the conservation efforts and the conservation movement. Canada wasn't far behind, uh, but America was, was on the leading edge at that time. Um, as Mel described in her talk, you know, there are other countries that manage in different ways. There are countries that have sort of moved in the direction of the North American model and attempted to emulate what we have, but in terms of the overall bounty of wildlife that we enjoy in North America, as well as the opportunities to enjoy that bounty, we are, we are unmatched globally. This is an, an image, a poster, an ad that a lot of you have probably seen, the Hug a Hunter, Hug an Angler campaign. Um, you know, these images, uh, they generate some laughs, for sure. They generate a lot of controversy, I can promise you. Um, but I think, in my opinion, they really nailed it in terms of epitomizing the North American model, all right? And I say that because there is a very profound, important relationship between hunters and anglers, the wildlife that hunters and anglers pursue and enjoy, the habitats that the wildlife live in, all the places they call home, and then by extension, the non-hunting, non-angling public that derives tremendous benefit from hunting and angling. And mostly because regulated hunting and fishing in North America, in Colorado, are the economic foundation for wildlife conservation and management in North America. They are the economic driver. We sometimes refer to that as a user pay, user benefit system. Um, Many of you are aware of this, but there's a lot of hunters and anglers even that are not aware of this. And I would reference the graph here, 
That is actually a graph from Colorado Parks and Wildlife's operating budget. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is the primary wildlife management agency in Colorado. Um, and the majority of their operating budget comes from licenses, passes, fees, and permits. Okay, and a lot of that is hunting and fishing licenses. So it's really something to be proud of as a hunter and angler and an important uh, piece of education for the non-hunting public. So hug a hunter and hug an angler. That's a real thing. All right, a little bit more history. Um, I would contend that um, the North American model has been developing and evolving since the first Europeans hit the continent, since the first European settlers arrived. And as we've already talked about, there was some really dark times in conservation history. Um, certainly market hunting and subsistence hunting had a tremendous impact on the wildlife resource here, pushing lots of species to the brink of extinction. We talk about that a lot, but sometimes I think we forget the tremendous habitat modifications that were also occurring at that time. Um, and you can imagine the impacts that that had on area wildlife, also pushing some species to the brink of extinction. We get to the latter half of the 19th century and into the 20th century, and technology is evolving rapidly. And so that technology not only allowed um, increased efficiency in the ability to take wildlife, but it also allowed us to exploit natural resources more quickly as well. And so all of those things were coming together. Fortunately, there were many, many uh, brave and hardy folk that pressed the panic button to get us to where we're at today. So, as with many things in our lives, a lot of these decisions um, are settled on the floor of courtrooms. And the conservation movement and the evolution of the North American model are no different. There are some really pivotal United States Supreme Court decisions that led to what we have today. And the one I want to talk about is the one that's most commonly referenced in some of the literature on the North American model. And the case um, involved Martin and Waddell. Martin versus Waddell. You can see how long ago that was, 1842. And we're not going to get way deep in the weeds. The actual court decision is fascinating to read if, you, if, you, if you're interested. But basically what it came down to is a landowner in New Jersey was claiming the exclusive right to the oyster fishery in a river. Um, and I have to preface this with that particular landowner acquired that land going all the way back to British rule. All right, so somehow uh, prior to independence, the king was involved and he had claim to this land. The chief justice in that case, and this is some really interesting language, the chief justice ruled that dominion and property and lands under navigable waters were held by the king as a public trust. So going back to British rule, uh, he went on to say, and this is fantastic stuff here. The king was without power to abridge the public common of Piscary. So what he's saying was, if the king is the trustee, he cannot prohibit the public from accessing those fisheries resources. This is great stuff. And of course, because this was following the American Revolution and our independence, the, the, the trust function that the king was operating on transferred to the state once we um, had sovereignty. And really what this all comes down to, um, Valerie's Geist is a prominent biologist, conservationist, hunter, professor from Canada. And he sums up the North American model really well. He called it what was, what was slated for as a tragedy of the commons is now a triumph of the commons in the form of the North American model. Um, I think that that's really fitting. And there was perhaps no greater tragedy, although there's, there's lots of examples from that era. The almost tragedy that we had with the near extirpation of the American bison, um, that some estimates say were as many as 65 million on the continent prior to European settlement. Um, more recently, the North American model um, wonderfully has been written down. It's been formalized by all sorts of folks. The Wildlife Society published this not too long ago. And I want to emphasize that it's not just hunters and anglers that benefit from this model. Our overall conservation, our scientific management, our research, everything we do re related to conservation and the, and, the, and the management of wildlife benefits from this model. Oh, there's my slide. <laughs> All right. So 
Man, I hope this keeps working. I'm gonna just wonder which slide's coming next. It's gonna be pretty cool. But uh, so here's the meat of, of the model. So I actually wanna go through the nuts and bolts of the North American model with you so you understand it a little bit more completely. Um, oftentimes when folks talk about the North American model, they reference the seven sisters of conservation. So there's seven pieces to the model. You need them all to make the model work, all right? Sometimes they're called the seven pillars of conservation, but either way, um, we need them all. All of those parts contribute to the whole, and we're gonna go through them one by one. I don't present them in any priority order necessarily, they're just numbers so that we can emphasize what we're talking about. And the first one we've already hit on um, in several presentations, and that's wildlife as a public trust resource. Um, again, this comes back to the public trust doctrine that the Supreme Court set us up with many moons ago. In Colorado and lots of other states, as well as Canadian provinces, this has actually been codified in law. So in Colorado, in Colorado Revised Statutes in Title 33, we, have, we actually have a legislative declaration that hits this perfectly. So there's two parts to it. The first part is that it's the policy of the state of Colorado that the wildlife in their environment are to be protected, preserved, enhanced, and managed for the use, benefit, and enjoyment of the people of this state and its visitors. So again, the government is the trustee managing wildlife for your benefit. You are the beneficiary, we all are. And two is just as important there, all wildlife held within this state, not lawfully acquired or held by private ownership is declared to be the property, uh, property of the state. For the most part, private ownership of wildlife is illegal in Colorado. Wildlife belongs to all of us. Perfect that Mel showed this slide because it emphasizes this sister of conservation, and that is the elimination of markets for game. We learned the hard way how commercialization and market hunting and things like that, uh, how that resulted in terms of wildlife conservation. It ended very poorly. And so essentially we've eliminated that. In England, this just blows me away, where you could, you know, folks are selling wild um, deer meat at a market um, at their discretion. In Colorado, this is a felony crime. So that's how far on the other end of the spectrum we are. Allocation of wildlife by law is the third tenant. And fortunately, folks realized that we were dealing with a finite resource. And that seems really straightforward, but if you think of the Lewis and Clark mindset, the things those folks saw, it would have been hard to reach that conclusion because of the abundance and the bounty of wildlife that they saw at that time. But it's a finite resource, and therefore, sustainability of that resource requires sideboards. And oftentimes, those sideboards include law. Um, I want to talk briefly about societal expectations, in that society does have expectations of hunters and anglers. Um, and oftentimes, they, those expectations manifest themselves in terms of law. So safety is a good example. The non-hunting public expects us to be safe when we are out hunting, and so some of our laws reflect that. The non-hunting public expects us to maintain a fair chase standard so that we don't have a, an unfair advantage over the animals that we're hunting. And so fair chase sometimes translates into laws. Laws are critical, as you all know. And just another little piece of trivia there, the first law in Colorado Territory relative to wildlife management was passed in 1861 and it, would, it pertained to manners of take for trout. The fourth tenet is that wildlife should only be killed for a legitimate purpose. This kind of goes hand in hand with number three we talked about, but again, it ensures that sustainability of those wildlife resources with that co overarching conservation mindset, the wise use of our resources. And also, again, maintaining societal support. Um, most non-hunters, in particular, whether you poll people in Colorado or across the nation, they are okay with regulated fair chase hunting, as long as the end game is for food. Once you start talking about hunting for other reasons, you lose support pretty quickly. But if it's for food, they understand that. There's some legitimacy to that that we have to recognize. And Mel set this up perfectly. This is a great example of where society said this is not a legitimate use of wildlife, and that was the plume trade. Um, look at that statistic. Uh, more than 95% of great egrets in North America were killed by plume hunters before that practice was banned. How is that even possible with relatively primitive technology? But if we did it, this is a picture of federal agents that have confiscated illegal plumes from plume hunters. That was something the public said, no way, we outlawed it. Not a legitimate use. Number five is key. Wildlife are considered an international resource, 
As we all know, wildlife go where they need to go. They don't recognize jurisdictional boundaries, city-state boundaries, private property boundaries. They go where they need to be. And so we have to be considerate of how we're managing our wildlife in relation to our neighbors. And there's no better example here locally that most folks are probably familiar with than how we manage migratory waterfowl with flyways. Ian, Ian did a great job setting the stage with this in that tenant number six is that science is the proper tool for discharge of wildlife policy. And the question I would ask is if we don't manage based on the best available science, what are we managing based on? Opinion, politics, special interests, Obviously, that gets pretty ugly pretty quickly. And so the best we can do is advocate for science-based management. At least that way, we'll have an even playing field to initiate our dialogues and move forward with constructive conversations. And the last one um, is the one we take most for granted. Uh, remember that 14-year-old that woke up and it was his birthright to be an elk hunter? Well, this is why, because we actually as a country, as, a, as North Americans, we have put this down on paper, um, and that is the democracy of, the hunt, of hunting. This tapestry kind of Ill, illustrates the flip side of the coin. You know, a lot of folks, when they think of European countries, think of other countries, they think of the king's deer. And historically, we think of that, that paradigm. And this sums it up nicely. You have someone, obviously, of means, wearing a crown, riding a fine equine, chasing the deer with his hounds enjoying that resource in and of for himself. That's not what we see in North America. This is what we see in North America. Um, and what we have here, the democracy of hunting is referring to equal access and ownership to the wildlife resource. We all have it. And the beauty of that is it creates a tremendous investment and a vested interest in the sustainability of the resource. And everything works wonderfully. So those are the seven tenets. Um, I don't want to be a buzzkill on this, but we have to talk about the future of, North Amer of the North American model. For those of you that grew up in Colorado, you've seen tremendous change. We all have. Um, Colorado is growing rapidly. There are people everywhere wanting to do everything all the time in Colorado. And that poses some pretty significant challenges for wildlife that we have to be cognizant of. Corey Knapp is going to talk more about this next week. Um, it, and so I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds on this, but this is showing a, a chart of the U.S. population go, growth and pro, um, projected U.S. population growth. And so you can see we all know that our human population is increasing. That's a given by how much time will tell, but the projection is that it's going to continue to climb. The disturbing part of this is this lower, this lower graph here that shows that as the overall U.S. population increases, the percentage of folks participating in hunting is declining. Okay, so we're going to have a smaller percentage of U.S. population hunting and possibly fishing too. Well, that has very significant um, economic challenges um, for one. So the question is, can hunters and anglers continue to put the bill for all of these challenges and these issues that we face with wildlife and a, and a rapidly growing human population? Black bears, folks get tired of hearing me talk about black bears, but this is it's a really good example of how this is manifesting itself in modern-day Colorado. On a catastrophic food year, um, where black bears are short on food, human bear conflicts escalate. We all know that. Well, Colorado Parks and Wildlife officers spend a huge proportion of their time responding to those bear calls. There are some places during certain years where officers do nothing but go to bear calls night and day. I don't have the data. Um, to substantiate this, but I would bet you lunch that the majority of the folks making those calls that we are responding to um, do not buy hunting and fishing licenses. Okay, so think about that. They are receiving a high level of service that they expect, and obviously we'll want to be invested in black bear management in the state, but they're not contributing economically. And can that continue to work as we go through and the human population continues to increase? Education is one way that I think we can make a huge difference. And it doesn't have to be in a formal setting like this. It doesn't have to be in a classroom. It can be educating ourselves, educating our families, educating our peers, our hunting buddies, um, our local political leaders. We have got to do a better job of educating the masses on the value of the North American model and the value of hunters and anglers in this country. People think of conservation organizations as hook and bullet clubs. They are certainly not that anymore. Most of these organizations, even if you are not a hunter or a fisherman, 
Uh, you can contribute to these organizations and their dollars are invested on the ground in terms of wildlife, wildlife habitat and protection. Join a conservation organization of your choice. We have to be extremely vigilant of commercial interests that would undermine or do away with the North American model entirely. We have to be engaged. We have to be vocal. And if the North American model is going to change, I want us all to figure out how it's going to change and the, the path that we're going to take in the future. Be vigilant. We need to support regulated, ethical, fair chase hunting and fishing. Make society proud of hunters and anglers. We have to maintain our ownership in the North American model. And I would ask, what legacy do you want to leave as hunters and anglers in this country, in Colorado, in Gunnison, Colorado? Um, what will our legacy be? And I talk about this with every group I interact with. There is nothing more important than habitat conservation and preservation. If we want healthy populations of wildlife in perpetuity, this is what we have to be thinking about with every land use decision we make. And I'll sum it up quickly here. Less habitat equals less wildlife, which will equal less opportunity, which equals less investment by us all which equals fewer resources for conservation, economically and otherwise, and then we all lose as a community, hunters, anglers, non-hunters, and anglers alike. Thank you for your time. Sorry for the technical difficulties.